So the Tim saga started off quite accidentally with somebody asking him if you know you want to be a bidder, and he said, "Well, yeah." Um, so, how did you get involved? Well, I was watching the Friday night news on a snowy evening, and I saw this young man uh, disrupting the Bureau of Land Management oil and gas auction. And having been the director of 1997 to 99, I was very familiar with oil and gas auctions and how they've been conducted. And I thought to myself, this young man's going to get really uh, taken advantage of uh, by the Bush administration. So I called some friends in the environmental community and said, look, if he needs a lawyer, uh, have him call me. And so the next day on Saturday, I got a call from Tim and I wanted to make sure that he had some shared principal values with me. So he came over and we talked for more than an hour about how the events had happened, how he decided to do this. And most importantly, that uh, I wanted to make sure that he was committed to uh, social activism in a non-violent, uh, thorough type of way of civil disobedience. And so uh, by the end of that discussion, I felt comfortable, but being a somewhat cynical lawyer, I said, let's meet again on Monday. And he came back on Monday. We had another extensive uh, discussion, and I was very convinced then that he was a very principled social activist who believed in nonviolent civil disobedience. So I agreed to represent him. And uh, in practicing law, I've been successful in part, I think, because I know what I don't know. And so I've done criminal matters, but never a criminal trial. So I approached uh, Ron Yangage, uh, who's a very good criminal lawyer, to see if he'd be co-counsel. Uh, he agreed, and then uh, Elizabeth uh, joined us. So we had a a team, and uh, we then proceeded uh, through my contacts in Washington to see if we could reach an agreement with the Department of Interior that wouldn't result in criminal prosecution. And uh, Secretary Kempthorne had been the sender from Idaho when I was director of BLM, so I knew him, and uh, I felt that if I approached him, he might use his executive authority as secretary to reach a settlement in which Tim would do so many uh, hours of community service and there would be no criminal prosecution. So I called Michael Bouchard, who was his uh, counsel, and uh, asked if there was that possibility and requested a meeting with Secretary Kempthorne, and he uh, agreed. So we met in Boise, and he seemed inclined to, again, use his authority as Secretary of Interior not to pursue a criminal complaint against uh, Tim and have Tim do 1,000 or 1,200 hours of community service uh, to see what could be done that way. And then nothing happened until the Friday before inauguration of President Obama, and I got a telephone call from Mike Bouchard saying, the deal's off, we're not going to do anything. And I felt from my days in Washington that this was a way for the Bush administration to hand off a political hot potato to the new administration. And since I knew uh, Senator uh, Salazar, who became secretary, and his assistant, David, uh, who had been deputy secretary when I was in Interior, I felt that we could make the proposition for a settlement with them, which I did. And uh, in turn, uh, they said, well, let us consider it. Uh, nearly four or five weeks went by, and then I got a phone call from David saying we're not going to be able to do the deal uh, because we are a new administration, we already are crosswise with some conservatives in the U.S. Senate and the oil and gas industry, and this would simply exacerbate the, the problem. So Elizabeth and Ron and I and Tim then knew that there was going to be a criminal prosecution but it was delayed because the U.S. attorney uh, in the Bush administration was replaced by the U.S. attorney in the Obama administration, and it took some time uh, for them to, to gear up uh, uh, for a trial. Okay. okay. Um, was there much of a conflict between Tim and the legal team about how you're going to go about doing it? 
Uh, I mean, I'll be very interested in Tim's answer. Uh, my own observation is that there was, uh, because he wanted to continue to be a social activist, and uh, his legal defense team knew that if he did some further social activism, particularly civil disobedience, uh, and was arrested, this would be a compounding factor used in the trial uh, and certainly be considered uh, in the sentencing, uh, assuming that there was a guilty verdict. Uh, we explored a number of defenses, uh, including what's called the necessity defense. And the necessity defense is best illustrated that if you're in jail as a prisoner and there's a fire, uh, you're allowed to break out of jail, which normally would be a crime because of the necessity to escape the fire. And some uh, activists in the context of climate change and the carbon dioxide buildup have said that it's necessary to break the law to demonstrate the impact of climate change. Uh, U.S. courts had not recognized that at the time Tim was going to be prosecuted. There was an English case uh, that we thought might have some application. Uh, Tim thought that that was going to be our primary line of defense. And the defense team again said, well, we'll certainly bring it up, but we're not going to put everything on it. And uh, we thought there were some procedural <clears throat> mistakes that had been made by the BLM law enforcement in arresting Tim and not immediately advising him of his Miranda rights, but instead interrogating him in a closed setting for nearly three and a half hours. Agent Love, who was the BLM law enforcement person who was subsequently been fired for misbehavior from BLM as the one who did that and who sat with the U.S. attorney uh, throughout the trial and uh, was part of, uh, in my judgment, the problem. Uh, I see Thames involved or at least working with a trial going in New York where they're accepting this necessity right. of defense. Is that becoming more common? Or is that well, there's common? a case in Michigan and there's a case in Massachusetts and, and the case in New York. And I think uh, some jurists are beginning to see it as a legitimate uh, defense. Uh, ultimately, it's going to be up to a jury or a judge, depending on the type of trial, as to whether or not it will be validated. Uh, I think given the you know, incredible changes in weather and other things that we're having, uh, that it will uh, be increasingly attractive. And that's part of the beauty of the common law is that unlike statutory law, there can be revisiting of doctrines that have been discarded and now seem more applicable and valid. And so I think the necessity defense may well be one of those. So at the time of Thames trial, that was a relatively new concept? Or? Not a new concept. It was simply not accepted as part of judicial doctrine. And, I mean, another component, uh, and this is where I'm still quite suspicious, uh, when a criminal or civil matter is filed in federal court, it is to be randomly assigned to the judges that are involved. But somehow, not so mysteriously to my mind, Judge Benson, who had been Senator Hatch's uh, chief of staff, had been the U.S. attorney under uh, Senator Hatch's direction, uh, became the judge uh, that we had to deal with. And uh, to say the least, he was not uh, disposed to uh, giving Tim any breaks whatsoever. And there were on two occasions when uh, he threatened to hold me in contempt in uh, terms of the proceedings because I objected to the rulings that he had made. And we found afterwards uh, from a couple of juries who came forward, not to us, but to third parties who then reported to us, that they had been intimidated by Judge Benson to the point they were afraid if they found Tim innocent, they would have been punished themselves. And clearly they didn't understand the independent role of the jury, but it was indicative of the environment that Judge Benson created in that uh, courtroom. Tim lectured the judge for about 45 minutes. Uh, what kind of thought went into that? Was that all Tim? Was that well, the morning of the sentencing, I met Tim at his apartment and sort of said, so what are you thinking? And he had played out different scenarios of remaining silent or uh, 
you know, making a very short statement. And then he also said, I, I think I may uh, give a lecture, and uh, the latter is what he did. Um, I have found with clients that at the end of the day, they're the ones who are at risk, and therefore uh, I can give them, and uh, Ron and Elizabeth can give them uh, their best judgment, but uh, they're going to act on their own. And so Tim clearly had had some very frustrating experiences uh, with the uh, judiciary, and so he decided to you know, make sure that Judge Benson understood and the public who were going to be aware of this understood uh, what was going on. Another vignette that I think is important to mention, uh, prior to the sentencing, Tim had to be interviewed by the uh, Bureau of Prisons uh, Parole and uh, uh, Pardons uh, Group. And so I went with Tim in his uh, first interview. He had a second interview. And uh, I think, this is again Pat Shea's personal judgment, that Tim was so eloquent and persuasive that the officer who was interviewing him really felt sympathetic uh, to him. So after the sentencing was over, uh, the same uh, officer contacted me and said that he had been in Judge Benson's chambers when Senator Hatch had called prior to sentencing and said that Judge Benson should put him away for 10 years or whatever the maximum uh, sentence was. Uh, so uh, that was disclosed to the press and of course uh, Senator Hatch uh, denied any fingerprints on the matter but that's exactly how Senator Hatch uh, operates on these kind of things. So prison is a big psychological deal. How did all that affect him? Well, uh, initially, uh, Judge Benson made you know a sort of show of force. Uh, normally, after a guilty verdict, if the defendant uh, requests uh, to self-report then the, he is free or she's free to be out until the due date to report to prison. Uh, in Judge Benson's instance, as soon as the uh, verdict uh, and sentence was handed down, he had the U.S. Marshals come to the defense counsel's table, surround him, uh, make him take off his tie and handcuff him and escort him out of the uh, uh, courtroom as a show to the spectators that, you know, I'm the boss, I'm in charge uh, type of thing. And so uh, Ron and Elizabeth and I immediately went downstairs and explained to Tim what was going to be happening in this turn of unexpected events. And so he was transported to the Davis County Jail uh, where they put in a holding system uh, until the federal uh, prison system can come and pick him up. Uh, sometimes if there's a federal prison within a reasonable distance, they'll go by bus. Uh, otherwise, there's what's called prisoner air. Uh, the Bureau of Prisons runs you know, an airline where they're transporting prisoners uh, from one prison site to another. So Tim uh, was in the Davis County uh, Jail for almost a week, uh, during which time uh, Ron and I had visited him on separate occasions. Uh, to explain what was going to happen because uh, the next step is they have to be evaluated by the Bureau of Prisons as to what location. We had requested that he get transferred to a prison in Colorado because his parents and sister lived in Colorado. Uh, that was denied and he was taken to Las Vegas and then he was put in a private uh, prison and that was the worst prison that he experienced because he said the guards pitted different racial groups against one another and really uh, had uh, despicable conditions and it was, uh, he was there for almost three weeks and then he was transferred to uh, northern Nevada and uh, northern California where there are state prisons and federal prisons and he was put into the federal prison in, uh, in Nevada. Okay. I've been struck by how eloquent he is in speaking and in writing. 
he went into prison with that? Did that did that improve a lot in the prison? Uh, I think it improved quite a bit in the prison, just because when you're in prison, I've represented prisoners for 40 years on 1983 civil rights claims, and uh, one of the biggest problems frankly, for the prisoner and for the prison administration is the amount of idle time they have where there's nothing really for them to do. And I think in that time, Tim was disciplined enough that he uh, was able to coherently reflect on his own principles and begin to articulate both in written form, in letters uh, to people, and in his discussions uh, with other prisoners. Uh, so I think in some sense if there's any good part of Tim's prison sentence of two years, uh, it was the solitude that gave him an opportunity to become more honed or refined in his principled stand and be able to articulate uh, the basis of that. Now, between the time he was charged and the time of the trial, which is uh, a couple of years, uh, he w uh, did become much more active in his speaking uh, engagement. And so I think he uh, developed a sense of self that allowed him to be uh, rather charismatic in terms of articulating his thoughts and getting other people to understand the nuances of principles that he uh, believed and, th and thinks that other people uh, should also uh, pursue. Now, I do want to mention that at one point uh, my wife and I were returning from California, so we drove uh, to uh, the northern Nevada federal prison, and I went in to see him, and uh, this is again part of the prison system. Uh, they made me wait almost two hours while they, quote, uh, got him ready, and what they had done is, in actually in an earlier case in 1976 through 70 nine that I had been involved in, uh, they had found it unconstitutional for solitary confinement in federal prisons. So now what they do is they put two prisoners in a room uh, and confine them to less than an hour a day of physical exercise. And in Tim's case, they put him in with a prisoner who had some serious mental problems. So after the two-hour wait, I met uh, Tim, who was handcuffed with his hands behind his back and his feet uh, handcuffed, or his feet handcuffed, and uh, he was clearly at a near breaking point in my judgment. There's a appearance in my experience where the eyes are sort of glaring, and there's a, a mental um, pressure that you, is very clear in speaking with him. And normally Tim was quite uh, eloquent. The other times I'd visited him in prison in minimum security, we'd had great conversations and he was very much himself. In this confinement uh, called the shoe. Uh, and how long did that last, that confinement? Oh, I think it was almost two months when I saw him uh, at the, the point that I felt he was about to break. So as soon as I left, I called uh, people at the Unitarian Church and said, we need to do something. And they had such an incredible communication network that at one point no one could call into the Bureau of Prisons office because there were so many external phone calls coming in. And then not so mysteriously, he was put back in minimum security and you know, was able to regain uh, some of the momentum. And then he... Uh, you know, was given a release date and, uh, oh no, not a release date, he was then allowed to be transported from Nevada to the prison in Colorado where I visited him again and it was a very different uh, setting. He was able to work in the kitchen and, and had much greater freedom and and this was ending, or coming near the end of two years and so he was beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel and, you know, Tim's original personality that I had seen when he was free was beginning to blossom uh, again. Um, what did you think of the support that uh, the First Church, First Unitarian Church, was giving him, uh, not only during the, the arrest and trial, but... It was indispensable. Uh, it was uh, particularly Reverend Goldsmith, uh, 
and uh, Joanne and, and the others were just uh, invaluable. Uh, when Tim was in that uh, purgatory of uh, not being prosecuted but being indicted, uh, they gave him a resource that he could rely on, a spirituality that uh, had harmony with who he was and uh, just the show of solidarity. It also, I think, honed his tools of being an educator because he was frequently invited through the Unitarian Church to talk to different groups who had a lot of questions about what he had done and, and what did civil disobedience mean and was it in the tradition of Martin Luther King. And so Tim became a really uh, astute educator and so I think that was very good. And then during the trial, and the marches when Jim Hansen and other people came out uh, and expressed their solidarity with Tim. Uh, it was the Unitarian Church that helped organize and facilitate and make sure that the public was aware of the plight that Tim found himself in. And then of equal importance uh, was when he was finally in prison in Nevada. Uh, I've seen this happen with other prisoners. They all of a sudden are completely alone and there's no support system. Uh, through the Unitarian Church and the people who were committed uh, to Tim, uh, as Bitter 70, I think, was the, the group that had been done, uh, they kept in rather constant contact with him. And I think anybody who has been in somewhat of an isolated situation, uh, that letter that arrives uh, one day a week or something really livens your spirit, and, and again, the Unitarian Church was key to that. I also failed to mention that there were uh, a couple out of uh, Colorado, uh, Telluride, uh, who produced a, a documentary called Bitter 70, and uh, that's a really excellent portrayal of the entire travail Tim went through from the point of arrest to the trial to incarceration. Uh, and uh, uh, Barbara and George, who were the, the couple, just did a remarkable cinematography uh, documentary. Finally, any advice for somebody doing something similar to what Tim did? One of the things I always stress is that people need to recognize that in doing civil disobedience as Thoreau or Martin Luther King or Tim De Christopher did, is that there is that moment of confrontation where you are going to cross the line and know that you are consciously violating the law. And in some senses, there's a certain thrill, there's a certain excitement that you're standing up for your principle. Uh, what a lot of people don't understand or expect is the skullduggery and the duration of drop by drop wearing you down uh, by this criminal process that are controlled by the establishment politicians or law enforcement people who are trying to break you down because you took that principled stand. And so I think people who are considering civil disobedience of a nonviolent nature need to understand that there is required an enormous amount of self-discipline that if you are at peace with yourself, I think can be easily, uh, or not easily, but can be achieved. If there are parts of you that are insecure or need some reinforcement, the people who are going to be imprisoning you or persecuting you are going to find those points and play upon them. So it's not for the weak of heart. It's not for people who uh, are just there for the moment. Uh, they have to be there for the day, the month, and the year uh, to make sure that their principled stand of civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience, is understood. Okay. <laughs>